Okay, so deck tech for uh, uh, Merfolk by popular demand. It's back. I am playing Merfolk again. Now, okay, uh, let's get this out of the way. Um, I know there aren't a lot of Merfolk in here, but we're still playing Svaloon, aren't we? So um, that makes it a Merfolk deck in my book. So look, okay, okay, you know, everybody... This is definitely a spiritual Merfolk deck. It's a Merfolk deck in spirit, okay? Um, yes, technically there are more fairies than there are Merfolk, but you gotta hear you, you gotta hear me. It it does kind of play like Merfolk. It just this is kind of the logical extension of what happens when I keep putting more and more spells in and I keep cutting Merfolk. Eventually you just cut Aethermile and once I and you know for those who followed my Merfolk decks, like, you know, I cut Aethermile a while ago, and I think it kind of was only a matter of time till this happened. Once I cut Aethermile, cutting a lot of the other Merfolk kind of seemed like maybe it was inevitable. But here's the deal, okay? This deck is kind of a brainchild of my idea that, at the end of the day, I think Svalun is an incredibly slept-on card. Not necessarily in Merfolk, where Merfolk players immediately realized that this card was the real deal for Merfolk. I think this card has a slept on card for blue strategies in general. Like honestly, I think this card it's you can justify playing it in is it Murktide? I mean, maybe you don't want to play all four of them. I don't know. I'm not really an is it Murktide player, at least not yet, who knows. But I think that you could absolutely play this in any number of blue strategies. Um and I think it's I think there's absolutely no reason why more blue players haven't uh, there's not a good reason for why they haven't experimented. They should and if they're not going to do their job, I'll do their job for them. Dang it. Okay, you know, that's not that's not a fair criticism, because I'm sure there's a billion and one other cards that deserve to be tested that I'm not testing. Uh, ain't nobody got time for that, I guess. I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, since nobody else is doing it, um, I'm going to do it. And, you know, spoiler alert, I've already tried this a little bit, and um, I think Svalun is the real deal. I think even if you're not really playing a compliment of Merfolk, um, the card's just nuts. It's It's got a huge butt. It's surprisingly good on defense. Um, I mean... Like, ultimately, if you need a 3-mana three 3-4 three, wall, sometimes sometimes that's kind of just what you need. Sometimes you just need a 3-mana three 3-4 three, wall, and Svalon can be that. Sometimes you need a clock, and this tax kick for 3 damage is pretty good. Also drawing cards. It's a card advantage engine. It's a clock. Uh, it's a it's a three, it's a 4-toughness, you know, 3-power wall if you need it. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah, the only downside is you have to play this at sorcery speed, but I think we would all agree if you could flash this in at instant speed... <laughs> I think it would be kind of busted, and yes, I think I think it would be all over Azorius Control and all kinds of other blue decks if you could flash it in. Its only weakness is that you have to play it at sorcery speed, but I mean, I think that's something we can play around. And the concept here, the concept behind making that work here, is we're playing Force and Negation. Yes, I know this is not a budget deck, um, and we're playing uh, Subtlety uh, for some uh, for some you know instant speed way to either interact or to make sure we don't get shut out of the game if we tap out. We got a lot of interaction even when we tap out at the end of the day is what I'm trying to say. And it doesn't even stop there. We've also got Chalice of the Void for, um, to preemptively shut off one mana removal spells like, you know, um, Unholy Heat, uh, multiple lightning bolts, um, Fatal Push uh, with uh, with Revolt. Um, you know, you name it. Just, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, Path to Exile. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that uh, this shuts, you know, Chalice on one protects your Svalon from. It's pretty nice. Um, you get to preemptively play this on turn two, and then ideally curve into Svalun turn three. It's not bad. It's really not bad. I'm telling y'all, it's not bad actually. <laughs> and uh, and we even got Vindelian Click, which um, you know, obviously we can't curve this into Svalun, but we can kind of play this as like a pseudo duress type effect. And sometimes we can use this to clear the way, clear a counter spell, or clear like a removal spell or something for Svalun, um, or just clear some threatening thing that we're worried that you know if we tap out and play Svalun, they're gonna cast it and, and win our boat with the game. Either way, or we can just see if the coast is clear. At the end of the day, Vendelian Click, surprisingly, um, actually kind of really helps the deck. Um, yeah, I mean, it is instant speed, but uh, critically, it uh, gives us some interaction uh, even if we, uh, you know, it, it gives us some interaction that allows us to see their hand and potentially clears the path for Svalun. So as you can see, I, I don't think it's misleading to call this a Merfolk deck with a under with a lowercase m. Okay, I know this isn't a capital M Merfolk deck, but I think it is. Okay, it's a fish deck. Okay, what more do you guys want? And fish decks like don't necessarily have to have a ton of fish. They don't even have to have any fish. This is absolutely a a capital F fish deck, and it's a lowercase Merfolk deck. And I feel like I can 
I say that honestly because honestly the whole deck revolves around Svelin. Like the deck is built to maximize Svelin's effectiveness, and I think it does that pretty good. Uh, in fact, I actually think this deck maximizes Svelin's effectiveness better than actual Merfolk. Yeah, I said it. Because at the end of the day, the main problem with Svelin is just either they untap and they immediately deal with it, or they, or more bat, or you know, even worse, they untap and they do some other kind of busted shit. Excuse the French um, that you can't deal with because you tapped out for it. And you can play it on turn three, and you still, uh, excuse me, uh, one second. Oh, excuse me. So I'm glad I spared um, spared a sneeze there for for all of y'all. Okay, look. Um, yeah, so I'm getting ahead of myself here. Just remember for some removal. Um, you know, plays around Chalice, which is nice. Uh, one other nice thing, that I feel like the deck fits together so surprisingly nicely. You, you wouldn't necessarily think that this deck actually works as well as it does, but, like, one of the things about Dismember is it, it, it synergizes fairly well with Chalice. Yeah, there's no black sources, so we can't exactly, you know, um, uh, later in the game it could be dead if we go too low on life. But one cool thing is, like, Vendillion Click does allow us to, you know, pitch extra copies of Dismember. Uh, if we can't use them later in the game, or if we don't just not place, place a good creature deck, for example. Also allows us to pitch Chalice, if either it's not a good Chalice matchup, or if it's, um, or if we uh, don't need more than one Chalice on one, for example. And Chalice on two is uh, doable, but it's a little bit, we start turning off actual stuff in our deck. Uh, you get the point. Um, Villain Dealing Click absolutely allows us to um, have a little more play with the Chalice and with the Dismember. Uh, and even with Force Negation, if we're not facing a deck with a lot of Force Negation targets like uh, humans or decks like that. So, you know, there's definitely some uh, value to be had there. Um, uh, and also, it's just a 3-1 Flying Beater. You can't discount that either. Uh, Brazen Borrower, there's not just, honestly, there's just not much better I think you can get for um, for a uh, two-mana uh, bounce spell, which I think we kind of need. Um, repeal is a possibility here, but the problem with Repeal is... We don't necessarily have a good answer to nonsense like, oh, I don't know, what if they drop a, um, what if they drop like a Platinum Imperion or something? I know that there's, people aren't playing that as much anymore, but like, yeah, and you know, the reality is, um, Repeal is definitely, uh, an option here, and it's, uh, more budget friendly, so, you know, but obviously Force Negation already, we're firmly in non-budget territory, but, uh, repeal is definitely an option, and it is theoretically possible repeal is better, but one thing I like about Brazen Borrower is that you don't actually need a target. Like, sometimes you just play this as a 3-1 flying creature, and you just, you know, I, I like this deck because this is mono blue midrange. This isn't really control. I like this way better than the mono blue control deck I had. And the main problem I have with control is I just don't like sitting around, countering stuff, waiting. Like, I just don't like waiting. I want to actually try to win the game. Uh, this is not a pure aggro deck because obviously we don't start playing um, threatening creatures until turn three, but uh, but it's very much a mid-range deck because we very much do start dropping actual pressuring cards, um, starting possibly on turn three, and we can back that up. And Brazen Borrow, I think, you know, fits into that strategy, so I like it. Um, obviously, we've got eight fairies plus four fairy conclave, so we do have um, kind of a little bit of a sub fairy theme going on. I don't think it's worth it to play something like Cyan of Una or something that actually rewards us for playing fairies because it's just, in my opinion, it's just kind of weak outside of the fairies. Um, but I think these are pretty solid fairies in their own right. And, you know, what can I say? I like them. Uh, it is possible repeals better, but, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna stick to my guns and I'm going to stick to Brazen Borrower for now. And uh, plus another thing too is sometimes, this comes up more than you might think, but, you know, it's not necessarily, it's not, it doesn't automatically mean that Basin Borrower is better than Repeal, and I'm definitely going to keep Repeal in the back of my mind. But one thing to keep in mind is that if you play Chalice on 1, you can't Repeal tokens. And with Urza Saga and other decks that spit out constructs, like, you know, or other cards that spit out constructs, like uh, Urza, Grand Artifice, or whatever, you know, since there's never been more, like, tokens kind of running around, or Rhino tokens, for example, that's a big one. Um, but obviously you're playing Chalice on zero against Rhino, so maybe a bad example, but sometimes you don't know which Rhino, so sometimes you play Chalice on one and just screw yourself over. But, you know, that's not that's another story. But, uh, you know, um, but yeah, like, uh, there's never been more uh, kind of tokens running around, and, you know, just having the ability to bounce a token is pretty good. And we won't have to worry about uh, Chalice turning off our ability to bounce tokens. So, um, yeah, and Spreading Seas. Uh, counterspell, you know, enough said. Obviously, can't leave home without it. 
uh, in a blue deck these days. Spreading Seas, uh, it's a must in a Urza Saga world, but on top of that, it's kind of uh, one of our main ways to disable utility lands, and it's kind of one of our only ways to actually win against Tron. Uh, this deck has, this deck probably has an abysmal matchup against Tron, if not for Spreading Seas, but with Spreading Seas uh, and with uh, these Tide Shapers in the sideboard, I think we do actually have a decent chance against Tron. In fact, we might even be favored. We do have Subtlety to um, delay their Planeswalkers, Force Negation to counter early Expedition maps, and uh, and uh, uh, Sylvan Scryings and other such. Um, so let's get to the mana base. Um, Blast Zone is one of the key cards in the deck. I mean, at this point, you know, my white, uh, most of my white decks are playing Blast Zone. My black deck is playing Bla Blast Zone. My my uh, you know red deck is playing Blast Zone. So why the heck shouldn't my blue deck play Blast Zone? I mean, especially if it's a mid rangey type deck, Blast Zone is just it's just I don't know. Man, enough said. I, I don't even know if I need to explain this anymore. But just the ability to just deal with almost anything. Yeah, sometimes it takes a while to pump in. But, you know, with so many one-drop creatures running around, like, sometimes they drop, like, three um, Dragon Race Channelers or, like, two Death Shadows or, you know, you name it. Sometimes they don't even know you got a Blast Zone. They drop multiple one-mana stuff. You just plop this thing down and you're good to go, man. It's like a one-sided Wrath. And and it's a land. You know, did I forget to mention? It's a land. You know, we, we don't have the luxury of playing something like Supreme Verdict and whatnot, which not even necessarily all Azorius right decks, I, I think, are even playing main deck. Not that they need to play main deck, but the point is, man, Blast Zone, it gives us some sweeping effect. It gives us, like, an ability to deal with artifacts and enchantments. It's, it's, it just gives us so much. It asks for so little. And, yeah, did I explain? It's also just a land that taps for mana. You know, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I don't think I need to explain Blast Zone anymore. But uh, especially in a deck like this, I think it should be self-explanatory. In fact, I don't even know if this deck would be playable without Blast Zone. But, I, but dang, oh, dang it, oh dang it, do I think it is playable with Blast Zone. Absolutely. I love it. Uh, now let's go to the uh, other lands. Before I get to the one-ofs, uh, Fairy Conclave. Yeah, Fairy Conclave, I know this looks a little weird and out of place. Why, what are we doing with a uh, with a, an aggressive kind of deck? Again, this is not actually control. So if this was straight up control, I don't know. Fairy Conclave, I still actually played it in the Mono Blue control deck, but I think this deck has way more of a home here. Um, something to keep in mind is uh, as the game goes on, sometimes you know, it stalls out a little bit, and, you know, sometimes, like, just being able to chip in here and there with a Fairy Conclave while the game's stalling out a bit, it just gives us the ability to close it out, you know? Um, sometimes, also, we're using Svelun as a 3-4, uh, you know, wall of sorts against a bunch of creatures, and sometimes Fairy Conclave can just fly over and finish the job. I mean, basically, all the deck is flying except for Svelun, so that's that's kind of nice. Um, fortunately, no way to take advantage of the uh, fairy, the sub fairy theme going on here, but just so happens that Fairy Conclave is basically the best blue man land, and I think an under an underappreciated man land. I, I you know, I, I, I this is like clearly not as good as something like um, Treetop Village, which obviously gets the most love out of all the uh, uh, Urza Saga original printing run uh, man lands. Um, you know, we all know it's not it's not quite a it's not quite Treetop Village. Um, but I think we could all agree, this is probably the second best man land. I mean, it's definitely better than the black one that turns into a 1-1 creature with, with pay one black regenerate. I think we can all agree it's better than the white one, a 1-5, uh, I don't think it's Defender, but a 1-5 like soldier creature or something. Like, I mean, that's kind of an interesting novelty, but most of the time, yeah. Um, the question is, is this better than the red one? Yeah, I think so. The red one turns into a 2-1 first strike creature. I think we can all agree this is the second best of the Urza Saga man lands, which may not be saying much if you think that, uh, if you think that, um, Treetop Village is a little dubious in the first place, which I'm sure some people do, but I'm going to respectfully disagree. I'm going to say, Fairy Conclave doesn't ask for a whole lot. A lot of times we can absolutely plop this down tapped, and we can play it on curve where it doesn't necessarily screw us up. And having an extra just creature, it's... I mean, sometimes we just block stuff with this. I don't know what else to say. And there will be situations where we need a blocker. Um, even we can block Flying Creeps. We can block, you know... Um, we can block... Uh, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, um... Lingering Souls tokens, if we have to. Sometimes you do, and sometimes that can be the difference in winning and losing. Even if it's not, even if it's not always like, even if it doesn't always feel the best, just having a two-one creature that can sometimes block stuff, but also just chip in and and sometimes just finish the game off. Um, it's it's a real deal, and I I think that uh, Fairy Conclave is a, uh, um, I think it's a welcome addition to the deck. I, I I've loved it ever since I've been in Merfolk. Probably some of you all have been. If you followed me for a while, you know that I. I started playing this a long, long time ago in Merfolk, and for the most part, I've never looked back. And, you know, I've experimented with different cards in a Lonely Sandbar, whatever, played a lot of different cards. I just keep coming back to Fairy Conclave because it's just, it just, all it asks is it asks for one turn coming to play tapped, and then, and then you have 
uh, you know, a creature for the rest of the game that's also a land. You know, unlike a lonely sandbar where like, you know, cycling it is cool, but if you don't cycle it, it's kind of just a strictly worse island. You know, fairy conclave. Um, you know, even if you don't necessarily use the creature, you'd be surprised. Just the, you know, you got to factor in sometimes they have to change the way they play to account for possibly increased clock or an extra blocker or other things. You know. Um, anyway, at the end of the day, I like it and I would recommend you. Uh, um, I'd recommend if you're playing mono blue, fairy conclave is absolutely something that uh, uh, you know, can be absolutely considered. And uh, Hall of Storm, Hall of Storm Giants. This this is also a card that seems that probably um, I think was also overlooked, but I'm actually seeing this see more love nowadays at uh, Azorius Control and other such. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, what this really helps against is some decks. They have like a lot of uh, removal, particularly like burn spells and whatnot. And yeah, sometimes they can hold up four mana and like fatal push this or something. But you know, when you consider that the that most of this, uh, most of the cards in this deck have less than three toughness, so three toughness or less, um, and like the only non three toughness creature other than Hall of the Storm Giants is a uh, Spaloon. I mean, that actually has more than three toughness. You can see that there is absolutely value to having to having a beefcake, and it just so happens that the beefcake is also a land. A, a land that a good chunk of time is going to come into play tap, untap too. So, yeah, and the uh, bottom line is, is uh, all the Storm Giants. It's actually better than it seems. Um, I can actually, I can actually vouch for the number of times that I've actually won because of all the Storm Giants. It's more than you think. Um, and uh, I think the downside, especially since because of the comes into play untapped ability in the first two turns, is uh, not something to be underestimated. Um, in Islands need need some. Islands, of course, otherwise we don't want to get completely shut off by Blood Moon. Plus, on top of that, it comes into play untapped. Um, not much more to say there. So then we have, um, I think these three are kind of no-brainers. Minamo, Voro, uh, Otowara, Otowara. You know, these uh, these basically are, are mostly strictly better than Islands. Only problem is, is uh, they uh, contribute to being color screwed with under under Blood Moon. Um, but it's enough of a tr it's a good enough trade off, and also like you know choke kind of sees play on and off too, depending on how blue infested the meta is, and the fact that these um, you know as a trade off they're worse against blood moon, but they're a heck of a lot better against choke. Um, you know I think I think the fact that they're in in especially the non blood moon matchups they're basically just free rolls and strictly better than islands I think uh, I think is uh, makes them worthy considerations. Then of course you got castle mantras. Um, you know, I could just play Nine Islands, but something, you know, and also, I also could play something like a uh, Horizon Land. I don't want to take the damage, though, to be honest. I've tried it before, and it's just, it just always feels bad. And I, I just like Castle Mantras. I mean, Castle Mantras is one of those cards that I played as a four of before, and it's felt pretty decent, um, you know. But at the end of the day, I just find that it's not as universally kind of useful as having another creature like Fairy Conclave. Um, and at the end of the day, you don't really ever need more than one of these anyway. So I feel like this is, this is a fine free roll as, like, the last... Um, the last one of type land to round out the uh, Minamos, Boros, Otawara. And Minamo is absolutely uh, super essential when you're playing Svelun. Uh If I wasn't playing Svelun, I could uh, definitely cut Minamo. Um, but, you know, yeah, I like it. I think uh, Castle Vantress, actually, uh, Castle Vantress um, sometimes just wins you the game, to be honest. Um, but it's, sometimes, of course, it could lose you the game too. But, you know, I, I think as a one of, it, it, it's very powerful. Um, it probably it could even be powerful as more than one of, but absolutely I think there's a there's enough upside and enough lack of downside to make playing this as a one of seem fairly appealing to me at the very least. And then of course, then of course we have uh, the and, and by the way with subtlety a lot of times as you'll see um, it's going to be important to actually hold up uh, and and hard cast this. Um, it is a very nice option to have to uh, to pitch it. But I would say the vast majority of time, you're going to want to hardcast it if you can. Um, it's very good value. It contributes to the tempo. Um, it's card advantage. Um, you know, I, I would I, so I would say that. I would say that uh, you, you want to be ideally hardcasting it. But the fact that you can pitch it is really good, and sometimes you really do need that. Um, so sideboard. Uh, Ratchet Bomb, I mean, more Blast Zone effects, plus it can deal with tokens. It's a necessary evil, and we don't really have any other Queen Ancestor artifacts in our champions, but we know it's good from Mono Red, Mono Black, and like all the other decks, too. So, you know, in it goes. Relic of Regenitus, we know how good it is. Um, only reason it's not in the main deck is Chalice is absolutely a main deckable card, but since uh, Chalice, it has, it's a non-bow with Chalice, we're going to play it in the sideboard. Uh, Deprive, 
Deprive is a little is a little iffy because uh you know we do like to hit our land drops, but we're not a straight control deck, so it's not the end of the world if we miss a land drop, you know, here and there. Um, it's just it's just on the cusp enough, like you know, I, I, I like it. I like having access to deprive, being able to like counterspell and deprive like on the same turn. Um, you know, counterspell they counter your counter, you deprive their counter kind of thing. Uh, and yeah, you know, you can't do that like if you have four lands and one of them's a blast zone. But a lot of times you're gonna have four. You're actually gonna have four blue because we we play twenty blue sources and four colorless. So you know, but at the end of the day, it's ultimately just more copies of counterspell, and there are certainly decks where we need that. And at the end of the day, I mean, you, there's other options, but I mean, hey, um, I've liked Deprive for a long time. I felt it's extremely uh, underrated, and I I definitely look forward to casting it again. Uh, Tide Shaper, uh, ultimately, Tide Shaper is for additional Urza Saga hate, additional Tron hate, and it also is a good way to go under and start the clock a little earlier against some control decks and some combo decks. Um, I really like it because I like having the option to have a little bit of extra beats, but the fact that it's it's kind of extra beats against, you know, some against a, you know, not an insignificant, insignificant amount of combo and control, a lot of which plays blue. Um, even if they don't play blue, you can still start attacking for two as early as turn three. You can play it for two mana, make a make something an island. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, it's just a nice option to have because it's uh, it's flexible. It's additional utility against uh, against lands, which you may need to have access to, and it's an extra beater. Uh, it just does multiple things. Oh yeah, and it's extra merfolk, so you could actually uh, create board states where Svalin is indestructible, and that could happen more than you might think when they don't necessarily expect that you are actually going to be playing a merfolk deck. Um, and that's the thing, we definitely sideboard more into a straightforward merfolk deck. So anyway, I uh, hope I explained this good enough. Wow, that's, that's a long deck tech, but I hope you all enjoy because uh, this deck is something special and I do like it. So, all right, take care, everybody. Okay. Uh, match one. I think this is a, this is a keepable hand. Um, okay, Dark Sleep. Okay, we're up against the Fabled Ad Nauseam. And you know what? I don't think there's any other deck I'd rather uh, uh, be, I'd rather have at my disposal against um, Ad Nauseam than uh, this deck. Um, I don't think they're going to play it, uh, a creature next turn, although I guess in theory they could have played um, they could have played uh, Thassa's Oracle. <clears throat> Obviously they don't. Um, so I'm just playing I'm just playing Fairy Conclave because I mean it's I don't know to be honest um, either Fairy Conclave is coming and play tapped some point later, or Hall of the Storm Giants is at this point. But, you know, when you got nothing else to do on turn one, it's, um, Fairy Conclave just potentially attacks a little bit earlier, so that's the only, that's the only reason. I'm almost certainly going to be looking to play Hall of the Storm Giants next turn, though, because, <clears throat> because, yeah, that, um, yeah, and then I'll probably spreading seas the, uh, Dark Slick Shores. Interestingly enough, yeah, maybe, yeah, you know what I'm doing? Yeah, I remember, I'm, uh, I'm making the conscious decision to hold Spreading Seas as fodder to pitch the Force of Negation, and I think I think my instincts are um, on point on that one. So they they suspended what's it called? Hmm, or maybe not. Maybe I uh, yeah I don't know. I'm kind of thinking maybe I should have just held on to Spreading Seas as a as Force of Negation fodder. I mean, because I'm going to need some kind of blue spell to pitch once I play Svelin. Uh, um, oh, no, you know what it was? No, you know what it was? I uh, I noticed that they missed a land drop. I mean, they uh, didn't play another land, and if they're only Black Source's Dark Slick Shores, I thought, you know, that can, that can have advantages, and I might be reaping advantages right now. So actually, in retrospect, I I approve of that. I, uh, I think that was correct, too. Go after the Dark Slick Soars. I think the original plan was to keep it as fodder, but then when I saw the missile land drop, um, obviously if I'd known that they wouldn't have another land drop, I, I should have fired that off and prevented them from playing, um, from playing, uh, you know, a Profane Tutor. But what can you do? You don't always know these things. And they do seem to be continuing to miss land drops. 
So, interesting question. I, I do think we're going to play Svelun, and I think we're looking to pitch subtlety. They don't really play too many Planeswalkers or creatures, so realistically, that's just kind of a situation we find ourselves in. Interestingly enough, if I did fire off the Spreading Seas on turn uh, on turn two, I would have been able to play Svelun on turn three, but I wouldn't have had a card to pitch, which could have been a dangerous um, place to be. So, I think what might actually happen here, unfortunately, is they might, because they have access to tutoring, they might end up uh, casting, ad, casting, yeah, casting, uh, what's it called, um, Angel's Grace, casting, uh, um, Spoils of the Vault. Casting, uh, casting uh, Thassa's Oracle, and then when I try to, um, well, actually when I try to uh, force a negation, the uh, spells of the vault, then they, um, or when I try to subtlety rather the uh, the uh, Thassa's Oracle, okay. Okay, now I think I have to force negation this. Although in reality, I probably should have waited to. Uh, I probably should have waited to play. Um, to play what's it called? Uh, subtlety on the Thassa's Oracle. I keep forgetting about that. Because then, if I do that, uh, then actually I might just straight up win because they go to zero and then they deck on their next turn. Um, yeah, see what I mean? Well, actually, I guess they don't. No, no, you know what? Never mind. I uh, totally made the right call. Uh, scratch everything I said. Uh, actually, it's a terrible mistake to subtlety the Thassa's Oracle, because then they just win the next turn. They don't go to zero cards in their deck. They go to one, and that one card on top of their deck, that's Thassa's Oracle. That's going to totally win them the game next turn. So, never mind about that. Okay, Brazen Borrower is a really sweet card, because um, this means if they go for the win again, uh, and they're relying on Friction Unlife, we can totally bounce the Friction Unlife in response. So, I think... That's pretty good. No reason to play Castle of Antris because once we have the island down, the Castle of Antris comes into play untapped anyway. So, this feels alright. Okay. Should I bounce the Unlife and play Brazen Borrower? That is the question. I think I do. It's, it's you know, nice to be tricky, but at the end of the day, just increasing the clock. Forcing them to have to pay three and replay it seems pretty good to me. Um, that seems pretty good to me too, and I'm probably going to want to play that on zero to counter the Profane Tutor. And I'm probably going to... not 100% sure I needed to do that, but you know, why not, I guess, right? Better than them having the ability to block. I'm gonna wait until Profane till next turn to play Chalice. That's what the delay is about here. Alright. Yeah, can't really uh do much about that. And I think I play the subtlety and then I just start attacking for lethal, I think. Not bad. Mono blue mid range. Although I guess friction on life actually. Never mind. Friction on life means that uh means that they go down to poison counters. Could win next game though. I mean next turn. Uh, I'm probably gonna want to cleat them on their upkeep. Okay. Uh, that happened. Let's get on a one. I may actually want to click now because uh, what if they have um, force negation, right? Tact negation. Well, we definitely want to force negation now if you think about it because they they have another angel's grace. What are we doing? What are we doing waiting? 
this is where we make a huge mistake here. This is this is where we make a huge mistake. Like, I guess the I guess what we were thinking was was we were thinking we could uh, take the profane tutor, but if we take the um, but if we took the angel's grace that they have to have in their hand, well, which they're they're gonna have in their hand now because of profane tutor. Uh, well, no, actually, never mind. The profane tutor is gonna get the uh, angel's grace, so never mind. The uh, take everything I said back. The man, this is uh, not necessarily a simple game. I still think it's got a decent. Just be able to break up the combo right now. Ooh, and uh, sure enough, they just happen to have the combo. You know, put spells of the vault to the bottom. The reason being is that we can subtlety the uh, the um, Bass's Oracle. All right, let's do it. I guess we can play Chalson too. Maybe we should have played Chalson one, right? Because spoils of the vault. I mean, do they really win with that spoils of the vault? Yeah, I think this is probably good enough anyway. Nice. Not bad. I definitely think we want to prive. Honestly, most of the deck is pretty gassy. We just obviously don't need dismember. We can probably at least put in one ratchet bomb so we can uh, tick that up. We don't need spreading seas probably. Honestly, I don't know if we need ratchet bomb so much. We could have maybe put more tide sweepers in there because we do need pitches. Um, I think I like it. I like what this deck's doing. Yeah. Alrighty. Um, I end up keeping this hand. That could have been a mistake. But uh, I do have early interaction. Probably just want to play out Side Shaper. Okay, never mind. I guess I'm looking to use Tide Shaper as some mana disruption. Alrighty. Alright, Ratchet Bomb it is. Gonna take this up, deal with stuff, and technically, we can keep them off of off of a win as long as we have subtlety. But obviously, it's not ideal because it puts the uh, Thassa's Oracle right back on top of the library. But if they don't have a pact negation in their hand, though, we can put them in a situation where if we ever do draw a counter spell for it, then then basically it's GG for them. Yeah, that is what it is. Definitely clicking out pressure bomb. Dealing with friction on life is one of the main reasons to play ratchet bomb. I think we play sh uh, tide shaper. Never mind. I guess we want to pitch, don't we? Yeah, I guess, truth be told, we need a pitch. If they try to go for the win, we can pitch Tide Shaper, and then we can Subtlety again, so we have two turns to draw a Counterspell or a Deprive to hopefully finish them off, uh, prevent them from winning with the Thassa's Oracle. At least that's, that's what the thinking is, I think. Let's see... Okay, Vendelian Clique. 
so this is not bad. Probably play this on their upkeep. Or draw step, I mean, rather. Never mind, or I'll play it another turn. Yeah, maybe end of turn is better. They're heavily disincentivized to go for it in the face of four open mana. This card is not good news for them, I don't think. A 3-1 body that also disrupts their hand. Yeah, they get to draw a card, but it breaks up their synergies. Hmm. Okay. They're going for ad nauseum right now, I guess. Okay, they just scoop. That works for me, too. All right. Alrighty, match uh, match two. Let's uh, see how this one uh, let's see how this one goes here. And I think this is barely keepable. Um, if we need to, we can always spreading seize our own blast zone for more blue mana. It is a possibility. Man, it's raining so much outside. It's like a it's like a freaking hurricane. I don't think we it's a hurricane in May. But anyway. Um, Raggy Taggy, well, good thing we got Dismember. Hey, go around, nothing to do but frown. Rainy days, Mondays always get me down. I actually don't really mind rainy days so much. La, 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 la. Okay. Not bad, not bad. I think I can live with this. Um, they're probably going to take Spreading Seas, I guess. Maybe I'll just remember. So it's actually be interesting to see what they take. Okay, so it must mean they've got another Ragadash, I'm guessing. Question is, do we Spreading Seas our own land? No, that... I think firmly puts us in the category of doing that to their land. Might as well bluff spell Pierce. But the good news is if they dash Ragavan, then uh, we can subtlety it when they dash it again. So if they're paying attention, they may want to just play the Ragavan out, but then um, I can bless on it before it gets in. So there's pros and cons to everything. And this also could be a situation where Fairy Conclave Potentially threatens to block, although I'm sure they must have a gazillion and one removal spells. Yeah, I don't know about this. I think they should have just played it out. Um, good news is there's not, other than spreading seas, I don't really think there's anything they could hit from me. And that helps with the mana flood, so. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think that this uh, puts us in a way better situation. We're definitely playing the island and just passing. Because uh, now if we can start subtletying that Ragavan, I think we're in pretty good shape. Yeah, let's subtlety. Start getting card advantage. -y. Oh yeah, hopefully they're not playing Grixis and actually have um, drawn in the lock. But I guess even if they did, couldn't counter subtlety. So unless they're playing Mana Leak or something like that, or I guess counter spell maybe it seems unlikely, then they're most likely Rakdos anyway. Now they're realizing maybe we should have just played Ragavan. 
instead of dashing where we put ourselves in this situation. La 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 la. Do we want to put this on top or just cut our losses? We already thought, seized, and saw they have another subtlety. At least that's kind of what I'm guessing they're thinking with less singing. So I apologize. I know it's cringy as I know it's cringy AF, but I can't help myself. I'm I'm to, I've already turned into one of those dad dadarino type you know persons. Not that I am a dad or anything, but I totally already turned into one of those people that doesn't care if I'm cringy anymore. Can you believe it? Like you know when you're like a teenager, like your whole life is like you don't want to be cringy, and then at a certain point you just don't give a dang anymore if you're cringy or not. You just don't care. You just cringe all over the place. And you know you're getting older when that happens. But what can I say? I guess we'll settle tea. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a card advantage for us. Oh, yes. Maybe our Spaloon survives after all this is said and done. La, 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 la. Okay, I guess no Ragavan either, or maybe they just tapped their lands really strangely. So we could maybe play this on too. No, no, no. You know what? Actually, I stand by it because I actually can't play. Uh, they can't play uh, Croxa and um, and uh, escape at the same turn. So I endorse this message. I'm M Hayashi, and I endorse this message. Oh, never mind. Maybe I don't endorse this message anymore. I did endorse the message, and then I unendorsed it. But see, this is a situation where now we can just chip in with Fairy Conclave, or just play another Svalon. That works too. I mean, they could have some type of reanimation thing, or some kind of blink effect for black, that like Undying Evil, but... You know what, and actually, I just real Oh, actually, Undying Evil gets shut off by Chalice, so... Yeah, I think... I think this is kind of what it is this point. So they did put Croxa back on top. Probably not uh, Ragavan, although maybe they did and now it's shut off forever with Chalice. But the good news is, is we can uh, juice, juice Blast Zone up. And we're going to start drawing cards with this Phelan. Always nice. Probably just uh, feed this to the Croxa. Feed the demon, as it were. Actually, if they flashback Croxa, they're, they're actually dead. Because never mind, I can actually bounce it and then uh, serve back with the... Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Not quite yet. I'm very close. I'm, I'm, I could just serve back. No, actually, I can. I can, I can serve back. Um, okay, maybe not. It's going to be a close call, but if they try to play the Croxa, I could respond by Brazen Borrowing, playing the Brazen Borrower, and I could serve back, put them out of one. So unfortunately, he's not lethal, but... Uh, and that's assuming I don't just draw land and just kill them with all the Storm Giants. So I think they're realizing, like, oh, no, it's not a good spot. See, see, this is just why I like being proactive so much. I love being proactive. I don't know what to say. You can't tap your mana like that if you're going for Croxa. Because I'm sorry, but Spreading Seas does have text. I'm sorry. Oh. So that's a little unexpected. Not going to lie. Hmm. I think we'll... Uh, you know what we're going to do? We're going to block one. Or do we want to block one? Mm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. I agree with this blocking one, but we are going to nonetheless. We really don't want to take unnecessary amounts of damage. And will we have one? Okay, <laughs> that's just so perfect. Oh my god, this must be so frustrating to play against.
We have the answers. We have the meat. Yeah, they realize they flash back Croxa, they're just dead. It's just, it's just over. I guess they still have to do it anyway. Well, I guess maybe not, because they're banking that we can't uh, counter. Um, I mean, they're banking that we uh, uh, can't attack with Svalin. No, I'm sure they're not banking on us having another subtlety. They're like, get out of here, man. What the frick? Hey, I don't know. I don't make the rules. So what is the plan? I think dismember against Ragavan. It's still pretty good. A chalice, yeah. Maybe, maybe Relic is better. Oh yeah. Um, spreading seas can actually help keep them off Croxa. Ratchet Bomb could be an idea. But at the end, I kind of like this deck. You know, Vendillion Cleek is kind of okay. But maybe we want to play Ratchet Bomb instead. <laughs> but seeing their hand is pretty valuable. I don't know. Part of me kind of feels like Deprive would have been better um, than like than like uh, um, Vanillion Clique, but we'll see. <sighs> this hand is very borderline. I think, but I'll keep because I have this from over for the Ragavan. So at least I don't auto lose to Stan. Mm, now they get to see this jank. Embarrassing as it may be. Do your worst, whatever you think it is to me. What does this mean? Thinking it through. Oh yeah. Spreading seas actually could be kind of good, but we'll see. I think there's a chance I may want to play it on Mount Blossom. They inquisitioned me. And I guess there's not much downside now to just casting on one of their lands. It does mess with their Croxa. Alright. Could have pitched Valen, but nah. I could have pitched. I mean, use subtlety. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's a pretty good card for us to get out of their hand too. So, so what the plan is, I think, hopefully, is to uh, is to bounce the uh, Liliana at end of turn, or bounce it in response to if they empty their hand. 
its own ability. Hitsugo concerns all. Wow. Yeah, we're definitely returning Liliana. So they're not even upticking. So whatever the last card is, they like it. I think we're going after Liliana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To place Phelan or not to place Phelan? I guess not, because we can pressure it with uh, Brazen Borrower. Is Sugu, like, it also kind of messes with them, with their own graveyard, doesn't it? Probably gonna destroy this member, although it could be useful against the Hisugu that's coming up, but yeah, so I decide yeah, it's gonna just a subtlety. Was there a reason not to tap the island? Alrighty. <laughs> to hold up subtlety or to play Svelon? That is the question. I think we were going to play Svelon, yeah. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pitch the subtlety when they uptick and then kill the Hisugu with a. Uh, Dismember, and then we're uh, like more hellbent, and we're all on the same page. Man, it would have been nice to hold up uh, subtlety for. I'll tell you that much. Now, I might, yeah, I was thinking about maybe not using it because they might be holding up a fatal push on this Phelan, but at the end of the day, you gotta do what you gotta do. I'm like, okay. Thinking about not playing that, just pitching that. We'll, we'll see. I'm gonna go that, that. I don't know for one black what they can uh, exactly kill. Unless they play like Disfigure or something, because Fatal Push ain't gonna do it unless they can get Revolt. I just don't think they can. Right here, right now. Alrighty. Um, yeah. And we play Hall of the Storm Giants. This is kind of a tempo deck. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, one of the ways you could conceive of making good magic decks is just to kind of, yeah, I, you know, I could see that one coming. I'm surprised I didn't do that end of turn when I um when I dismembered it end of turn. I mean, they're just more accepting, expecting it. I don't know, um, but still. I'm not going to try to eat it with the subtlety. It's just not worth it to me. I could play another Liliana. I could totally subtlety it. Oh, that's... <laughs> if this is uh, wasn't uh, what we should obviously subtlety, I don't know what is. It's clearly... Clearly 
the card I'm supposed to subtlety. Bam. Alrighty. Yeah, and now I can. Uh, yeah, see, I got six, so not quite, uh, not quite yet. This might be a game where I end up taking it with the Hall of Storm Giants, which is always nice. Let's see if they, uh, if, if they try Turok Time again. And I'll be the first one to say Turok Time is very cool. I love Turok Time. I am not trying to say Turok Time is bad. However, Turok Time is not going to work. Alright, that is what you call a cool story, bro. Um, I think that's a mistake. Because the, now they die to Hall of the Storm Giants. Yeah, we'll do this in case they have a... All right, and that's what we call a wrap. Parappa the Rappa. Alrighty. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yep. Even if they have some like dismember, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna save them. Okay. Wow. Okay, match three, we're on the play. Let's uh let's see here. And uh I definitely think yeah, Fairy Conclave is the way to go, that's for sure. Oh man, frickin' uh that's probably death and taxes. I should have I think I almost immediately regret not force negationing that because the problem is is suddenly counterspell ain't so good anymore. I'm going to skip a little bit ahead, but suffice it to say, that is a potentially game-losing mistake right there. Uh, draw Chalice. Oh, but actually, maybe my thought process was I can Blast Zone it all the way. It's an interesting thought process. It's not entirely incorrect. But here's the problem. See, they drop... Okay, that's not Stoneforge Mystic, so at least there's that. Yeah, so what they did is they ghost quartered me in response. Yeah. Flicker Wisp. Yeah, unfortunately, it's getting a little bit tricky here. I can't deal with another Aether File, but at the end of the day, yeah, that's the problem. I'm surprised I didn't go after Chalice, because Chalice on zero kind of does nothing, right? <sighs> yeah, this is a... This is a challenging here. Yeah. Orzhov Control. They're not playing Orzhov Control. Yeah, that's going to be necessary against, against Aether File. Uh, that does nothing. Uh, I should probably try to take out counterspell. Yeah, for, I guess I guess we should put in Tide Shaper and I guess Relic for lack of anything better. And yeah, I guess that's that. Maybe I should have left in counterspell because with Ratchet Bomb, you do increase the chances of being able to take out their. Uh, Vile. Let's see here. Okay, we played Fairy Conclave, they play Giver of Runes. Play Ratchet Bomb. Okay, Orlando Rella quarter on our Ratchet Bomb, that sucks. Oh, but I guess I guess we uh tried to uh protect it with pitching subtlety. Interesting play. Um Archon of Ameria. Interesting. Cards Phelan. Phelan could definitely do some good work. Uh, okay, that that's where we start getting into trouble here. We go take take up Ratchet Bomb. We definitely want to go to three. I don't know why I didn't take this up to three. 
I think that was just a mistake. I think I remember at the time being like, dang it, man. I'm going to do this now. We're going to hold our peace. And then I forgot about Archon's ability. So at least I returned it. I really should have ticked that Ratchet Bomb up to three. I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe I can set up some kind of Hail Mary type play. So they obviously equip, they obviously attack, but then <sighs> I played Odawara, I guess. Yeah. Some nice little nice little ability. If I do say so myself. Um, yeah, I've probably been dealing click on their upkeep. Alrighty. Yeah, and I guess I can, I guess this was the plan, right, to take the sort of Fire and Ice away. This way. Okay, so they Skyclave Operation my Long. That sucks. Do have another one, though. And these little flying do do my hickers. Obviously do have certain benefits. Technically, I'm threatening lethal in the air now next turn. I'm going to hit the Straylon again. Yeah, but they, I mean, at the end of the day, they were afraid of the Straylon, but yeah. That we got them, the just good old flyers. Well, I guess it's not completely getting them because if you think about it, we're gonna win a one. But I still think we're in pretty good shape. Yeah, so they're going on a three. Place Phelan. I guess I probably should have attacked with the illusion token too, right? Archon. I think I should bounce the giver and then play this at the end of their turn, but fortunately, I, I forget about Archon's ability again, I think. Yeah. That sucks. And I guess I do this. What does this lead to here? Got a long pause here, not sure why. Okay. Yeah, I like this. I like where that leaves us. 
Uh, I think I made a mistake and I should have killed the Skyclave, but that was obviously just a mistake. Oh, and I think I could have played the Blast Zone too. Oops. No, actually, no, I had the uh, Fairy Conclave here, my bad. Yeah, and I, th I think we've got Mega Lethal here. We know about that. And we got Super Lethal. Alrighty. think that's that. Yeah, one second. Yep, and that was that. They conceded. Okay. Um, yeah, I just resubmitted, but in retrospect, I probably probably should have counterspell instead of Relic. Relic is just kind of just a two-minute counter. It's not the worst in the world, but it's also far from the best. Yeah, I'll keep this hand with double ratchet bomb. You know. Dahlia creates problems because I was supposed to do turf two ratchet bomb. Now I can't. Boo, you, boo, boo. Okay, and we get, I think we're getting thoroughly tempoed out here. This is what happens. Relic us. So I probably stone forge mystic. Good turn. No, they don't. But still, at the end of the day. Do yeah, play double ratchet bomb. You know this is actually not half bad. Ready? Yeah, I mean get the get rid of that one. Sacrifice conclave. Whew. I think I'm gonna want to crack Ratchet Bomb. Third keep probably. Alrighty. Thalia. That's a problem. So I have choices. I think I'm gonna put Ratchet Bomb up. Probably put. I'm probably gonna. I might just attack with all the storm giants. I mean, it's, it's a it's a bigger harem hail mary type play. I'm not sure why I ended up doing this because now I can't attack with all the storm giants. I can't block with it either. Probably should have at least tried to attack with the Fairy Conclave. I'm not sure what I was thinking. I guess boosting up Blast Zone, that's what I was thinking. To be fair, it's not a bad thinking, even though a Ghost Quarter makes that difficult. Well, I can blast zone for three, although they're surely going to ghost quarter in. Let's see here. You know, it actually kind of looks like we're taking control of the game here, but no famous last words. Why do I have a sinking feeling in my stomach that somehow I just throw away the game? Like, for example, I, I think I... I have to know to bust this first, then I place Phelan. I think what they do is they end up playing a flyer, and then, I don't know, but then I do have three flying blockers, so. Let's see. Horizon Canopy. Okay, and 
that's fine. Oh, I know what I remember what happens. Caldra complete. Oh, here it comes. Okay, well, okay, it's it's a turn delayed, but here it comes. All right. Problem is, I don't have an easy way to get rid of stone forge. At least not an easy way that also. Stoneforge Mystic. Oh, they got Stoneforge oh, nice. And I think I don't really have an answer to that. I should have given some serious thought to going after Ghost Quarter. Yeah, I missed that. Just like that. Oh, my dreams come crashing down. Nothing I can do. Uh, all right. All right, match four. We're on the play again. Let's see. This is, I think, a keepable hand. If I've ever seen one, I can't. Uh, I can't not keep this hand. If you know what I mean. And excuse me for going through the last one a little quick, but just that one was a. Uh, kind of like grindy a bit and, and also just kind of disappointing but you know what can you do all right hammer time i like that new ornithopter art i do have to give wizards some credit sometimes if you know what i mean That is a problem here. I think they go get a uh, Colossus Hammer. Unfortunately, man, the uh, with the recording software doesn't show what they actually got. But I think they got a Colossus Hammer. But in case they have like a Calder or something, I have to, I think, do something about that. That would have been nice last turn. If I don't have an immediate access to Here's a saga, I think I kind of out of luck. Ugh. Okay. Yeah, thank God they didn't create a, a token. I can't even pay the one. It's nice. You know, wish I could do something about that. I guess I could have with with force negation, but I don't have to like do it right now. Yeah, that's a, it, that could be a nice bounce spell, but I think it's better just could be better off as a land right here. Yeah, cool story. That is for sure. And I can bounce that. Although, man, bouncing that would have been... <sighs> yeah, I want to bounce the uh, Construct token. I think both of those cards are kind of what they are. Take the reality chip, put that away. Yeah. Alrighty. I'm gonna block the uh Oh, for some reason I thought I had uh I thought I had uh Brazen Roar. Looks like I don't. Well, that was uneventful. I just didn't have any spreading seas. Brazen Borrowers are the normal type of cards for this matchup, which is fine. Interactive Bomb is excellent. 
um, tide, tide Shaper is excellent. Yeah, you know what? Chalice is a trap in this matchup, IMO. Mostly it's because of um, because of Urza Saga. And I can't necessarily completely... And because of Stoneforge Mystic. But at the end of the day, when they've got so many ways to go through a Chalice, either Urza Saga fetching or... Or Stoneforge. It's it's at the end of the day, it's not it's not that Chalice is like bad, but I just think that the other cards are better. This member is better, Svalun is better, because Svalun's a clock and draws a card. Vendillion Click, I think, is better, because it Well, I, I maybe Vendillion Click wasn't better, but that obviously got cut. Subtlety is better, Brazen Borrower is better, Force Negation, Counterspell is all better, so. Plus plus uh Chalice of the Void sometimes gets swept away with Ratchet Bomb, because I need sometimes need to do Ratchet Bomb on the Ursa tokens. All right, let's see. Uh, All righty. Yeah, all right, double haul the Storm Giants. Don't have to have either of them come into play tapped. Pretty good if you ask me. Now I've got double Brazen Borrower, and I've got Spreading Seas if they got Urza Saga. Oh, this sucks, but I'm going to trust that I will draw like a Blast Zone or a Ratchet Bomb. Okay, that is what it is. Again, I wish I could see what they actually fetch. Oh, there we go. That'll I don't know why sometimes I don't see the little pop up, but sometimes I do. All right. Um. Man, nettle cyst. I might have to hard cast force on that. Actually, at this at this rate, it'd be it's better if I pitch. So I'll probably have to pitch a uh, brazen bar where I'm guessing. If they play nettle cyst. Yeah. This prevents them from drawing two cards. So definitely better than uh, them drawing two cards, even if I didn't have to pitch. And now I can hold up Subtlety. I've got a, I've got a good feeling about this. I think things are going to go our way. I'm a believer, that's for sure. That's fine. I could just put in Brazen Borrower just to race, and I think I will if they don't play anything. Because that puts on pressure. Yeah, that just puts on pressure. Because uh, I, I need I need them to like actually, oh, oh, you know, bad stuff to the board. If they just if they're winning the race, okay. And there's the blast zone I was I was a believer in that I would I would uh, get, and I do think we're winning this race because they're so from here on out. They're on a uh, five-turn clock, at five times three, and we are on a uh, eight-turn clock. Yeah, we're on an eight-turn clock. So that's how much that's how much one power difference makes. All right. Yeah, let's just keep adding to the board. See, this is the power of like a mid-range strategy. Like control doesn't do this. We actually outrace them. They're flying, so they can't block them. Yeah, I guess that's that. Cool beans. All right. Da 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 da
let's see I think let's run it back so yep Ooh, judging by how much of the match is left I think this one this one might be kind of a slog let's enjoy it together though shall we Okay, well, the question is do we tide shape or do we spreading seas? I think tide shaping. Because the body sticks around on like spreading seas, and the spreading seas can hit something else. They might make one token off the Ursa Saga, but we can raise a borrow that token. Yeah, see, they, they sandbag that so they can make a token, which is fine. It is what it is. I hate these zero mana creatures making uh, Ursa Saga tokens on turn two, but I think in the end we're going to be okay. I think I should have tied shaped. No, actually, I need to draw. I need to draw and hit my land drop. So never mind. Okay. What's the plan now? Pure Steel Paladin. Okie dokie. Yeah, I can't let that resolve. Just just not gonna happen. I don't need two straight ones either. Alright. Yeah, see, he's forcing negation. Like, like uh, Chalice of the Void couldn't do that. I think, I think the play is that we pass, and I think for mana efficiencies' sake, we end of turn um, bounce the token. I think we have to hold up. I think, yeah. Let's, we have to hold up. Counterspell. Like, if they play Reality Chip here, then we just lose. And we don't have a Counterspell, I mean. I don't I don't think that's a good idea for us to re let Resolve. Not at all. If we can play Svelun and hold up Dismember, that would be... Real deal. Alright, I feel good about this now, I'll tell you that much. <sighs> I'm just trying to race this with poison. That is something to be worried about. It's like we're taking four damage, uh, but from a different, you know, with a different sort of life total involved. Yeah, I just think we just play Tried Shaper just for efficiency. Well, I guess I could slow him down by hitting the Moth. Yeah, that is that is a uh, quite a fast clock. Thankfully, we could have it cut it in half with uh, Tide Shaper. Any. Not bad. Man, I just love Svalon when it actually goes online and starts doing its thing. But then again, who doesn't, right? Now, should I just play double Tide Shaper? Or I should probably... I'll just play one. I'll, uh... I, th I think that's what the plan was. It's just to be a little bit conservative here. Because I feel like the only way we lose is some kind of, like, pure steel platinum out of nowhere nonsense or something. So Forge Mystic... Sort of fire and ice would kind of suck. Okay. 
do they get? For some reason, the pop-up didn't, didn't show up, but I think it's sort of fire and ice. There's nettle cyst. Yeah, I think I just bounced the token then. I could also bounce the nettle cyst itself, actually. Maybe bouncing the nettle cyst itself is better. Nah, yeah, the bounce of the token's better. Alrighty. Yeah, it's interesting games, but I think we're getting t into the home stretch. I think I tied shape the other one. I think. That does reduce the artifact count too, effectively. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't actually disable the Ink Moth, because that, that could make a blocker. No, but you know what? I, I agree with this, actually, because I also wanted to hold up Dismember, so... I think that's fine. I don't know. I, I, I kind of disagree with this. Okay, there we go. Going to one poison doesn't seem too bad. But I guess I'll do this anyway. We're going to have some instant speed way to put an artifact into play. All right. So I might just attack with the Brace Borrower. No, definitely with that too, because that draws a card. This was kind of risky. I think I should have actually kept the two Tide Shapers back. Because um, at the end of the day... I guess my thinking was the Svalon is indestructible. Cause, see what I mean about having those Tide Shapers as utility creatures, but also as a little spi extra spice to make uh, Svalon indestructible? Now, the problem I have here is that I lose if they top deck a Shadow Spear. And knowing Hammer Time, there's always a very, very real risk that they top deck a Shadow Spear or a Stoneforge Mystic. Might not happen this time, though. Actually, I guess they don't instantly die because it's five. I could absorb four indestructible. Uh, I mean, I could just uh, could absorb, yeah, four toughness. So actually, I just go down to three. So maybe, never mind. I guess Shadow Spear doesn't outright kill me. But, but pure steel paladin into shadow sphere into hammer of colossus since it draws a card it does into another hammer of colossus into another hammer of colossus I mean colossus hammer. Well, see, there's the stoneforge mystic, but I forgot that I actually can. I think they are going to get shadow sphere, but I actually forgot that I do have four toughness indestructible, which is pretty good. So see, they always draw the best possible card. So you have to put yourself in a position like here, where even their best possible card isn't enough. So maybe it was actually good for me to attack with both of those Shadow um, Tide Shapers. Um, yeah. Because now they're in a position where it's going to be hard for them to attack, but they also they also kind of have to attack, because if I just 
move this up to one, then I just kill the Shadow Spear anyway. Um, but if they don't attack, then I think I just attack with everything and then go up to Shadow Spear before damage. But if they do attack, uh, they gain five life, go up to six, and you know they live to fight another day. They have to block everything, I think. But let me block. They have to tap too. To tap the Stone Forge Mystic. Attack for five. Go up to six. And I guess they do take lethal actually, so never mind. They would actually have to go to the Ornithopter, I think, because tap the Ornithopter because uh I could just clear that out of the way. But I still think they tap the Ornithopter, gains not even six, they gain five, go up to six. I go down to three. And then they have one untapped Stone Forge Mystic. They block this Phelan, and they take seven. They're at six, they die. Yeah. See, they, they, this is how it works with Hammer Time. They always draw the best possible card that they possibly need. But uh, the best possible card isn't good enough. Oh. I still think the best possible card isn't good enough. Because... Yeah, because they have to tap the Stone Forge Mystic. Yeah. If they if the other Stone Forge Mystic could tap, we'd be in trouble. But they have to tap the only Stone Forge Mystic they have. And unfortunately their egg the exile clause means we lose our Sphalon, but we still have flying. Oh but I guess Yeah, they die on the counter swing though. They have to, I forgot they have to tap a creature. I mean that's scary, but ultimately they still only deal two damage. And they have to tap out. So GG's. They drew the best possible card. Still wasn't good enough. That's, that's how you got to beat Hammer Time. Alrighty. Okay, we're in the home stretch. Um, we have been lucky enough to be on the play most of the time, but uh, hey, we'll take what we can get. But at the end of the day, I think uh, I think we've been proving ourselves to do pretty good. And as you can see with Hammer Time, if you play carefully, they don't really have a lot of outs. Um, you just you ha what you have to do is you have to pr you have to play as though they're going to draw the perfect card at all times and you can beat them you can and you will beat them but you have to respect them always drawing the best possible card that's why i attacked with those two um tide shapers if i didn't do that then i might have been in a position where i'd actually lose but i i basically had to think of all the worst case scenarios and the worst case scenario was basically a stoneforge mystic and I put myself in a position where I still win if they draw their best possible card. That's what I did. I was able to win. And I think that's one reason why we're not seeing as much hammer time anymore is that it's just, it's a good deck, but but Luris was kind of what enabled it to overpower some decks. And, you know, without Luris, it it's kind of just like, yeah. It's not bad, but, you know. Yeah, this sucks that I had that I played Chalice on one. I just I didn't know what I was up against. And against most decks in modern, they play one mana cards, but a subset of cards play a subset of decks play uh, zero mana cards. Okay, this uh, guy's taking a long time, so Okay, there we go. Cycle another striped riverwinder. Flooded strand. <laughs> Okay, breeding pool. Raven, wind collar, even. The problem is, is I think they're going to play violent outburst on my upkeep, and uh, then they're going to force negation by force my hard cast force negation, which sucks so much I can't even describe it. But this right here. 
the play they can make is just so BS. It just it makes me want to um makes me want to complain about banning violent outbursts. Just violent outbursts. I just hate the way that that card can be played at full speed. They can play there are shardless agents and all this other nonsense. That's fine, but I, I hate the way violent outbursts is instant speed because. I hate com instant speed combos because they enable you to abuse force negation in a way that was just not intended to be abused, you know. Force negation was supposed to be a defense to, gener to degeneracy, not a um, not an enabler of it. That's why it can only be played, uh, so it can only be heart altered at cast during a punishment. But instant speed combos lend themselves to abuse because you can uh, cast them uh, the opponent's turn. All right. Okay, so enough of that. But good thing is we have quite the sideboard, and I think we would have won if um if we would have known to play Chalice on Zero. But we get to play Re Relic, get to play Deprive. And dismember is kind of not necessary. Yeah, I think we get to play. I think we should probably play Tide Shaper. Tide Shaper. Realistically, I think Tide Shaper is probably better than Subtlety can be good because Subtlety can can just come out of the graveyard instantaneously if we need it. I don't know if it makes that big of a difference, but it is worth noting that if they Living End, um, we can always just pitch a Subtlety and then it just comes out of the grave with Living End. But the problem is, is a uh, three three flying is not that impressive. See, I feel like this hand would have been better if these were Tide Shapers, but maybe not. Would have been able to put more pressure on that, that's for sure. That's a good card. That's a good draw. I got a Force Negation my Relic. So another thing too I hate, like using force negation to fight against opposing hate. Feels really BS. Like they obviously did not print force negation to do that, to help the combo decks. Ironically, I feel like most of force negation, most of the use of force negation is in decks like Rhinos, in decks like, you know, Living End. In decks that ironically are kind of degenerate. And our combo esque. I know Rhinos is technically not combo, but it, it is a little combo esque. Um, yeah, this is so bogus. I don't think Force Negation ended up being played in most fair decks. It was supposed to defend against degeneracy, but it really does feel like it ends up um, enabling it, you know. Okay, buddy. Well, they're mana screwed. All right, Svalon time, and this is pretty good because they can't, they can't um, living in next turn. And if we can keep drawing cards, I think eventually we'll draw into more hate, which is obviously just what the doctor ordered. So far, they don't have any flying creatures either, which means, in theory, we could try to fly over for the last points of damage with the Vendillion clique out of the graveyard, but, you know, and possibly subtlety. Okay, they just give up. If we pitch cards, get subtlety in there. Okay. Yeah, and I think I'm thinking about maybe we do want Tide Sheeper. But I do think I'm thinking about the application of subtlety just going into the graveyard. Or just uh, dealing with some hard cast creatures later in the game. Which is something to think about. What did I do? I... Okay, I took up Brazen Borrower. That's, uh, that's defensible, I guess. Brazen Barware, though, I think uh, <clears throat> is a little bit more proactive than than uh, 
subtlety. I don't know why I'm so dead set on subtlety. I think if I were to redo this, I would probably cut the subtleties instead. Yeah, so I'm leaning on this just because I um I really uh, want a good clock. But in retrospect, I'm like, ooh. Yeah, probably, though. But in retrospect, I'm like, you know, no, and also I want to be able to cycle Relic. And, uh, you know, because if they play, like, um, Foundation Breaker, I want to be able to get at least get card advantage out of the Relic. Ooh, excuse me. Even one color definitely does seem a little overcosted. I think I have to play Relic. In retrospect, playing Relic turn 1 and then holding up Counterspell could have been better. But it is what it is. Okay, they don't have Force Negation. That's, that's good news. Let's see here. Um, what we got to watch out for is we got to watch out for them playing something like Force of Vigor or uh, found, yeah, something like Force of Vigor end of turn, and then in response to us cracking, they play uh, they play Valon Outburst, and then in response to our counterspell, they force negation our counterspell. I think they're fishing, hoping for us to. Um, play Counterspell, and Force Negation the Counterspell or something, but I don't think we're going to have any of that. I think we're going to just uh, crack the Force Negation. Maybe. Yeah, I was a little worried about Street Wraith, but... Yeah. Right, unfortunately, I can't drop both the Tide Shapers. Just the nature of the mana base. Still think pretty good. Okay. Alrighty. Not bad. Once again, I can't cast both, so. But starting next turn, I think I can, which is pretty good. Pretty good. See, and I just like the way Tide Shaper is just like a little beater that just gets in under nonsense, and I can still hold up counter magic. It's very important. This is, it, this basically allows me to go a bit more aggro, if that makes sense. Um, I know I know Tide Shaper seems kind of like an awkward throwaway type card, like just a hangover from the Merfolk days, but it's really not. It's actually it actually does a surprising amount for the deck. Um, I really like it actually. Believe it or not, I really do. Alrighty. With double counter spell, I feel fairly good. Next turn I could attack for lethal, but then I could, I could get blown out by a uh, Valon up burst, so I might just attack for eight. I see this is their plan. Well, that's not the most threatening card. 
Yeah, I'm just going to leave both counter spells up. This also effectively shuts down their um their fetches. Hmm. Actually, let that resolve. I'm a little surprised about that, but I guess it makes sense, sort of. Hmm. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little surprised to let that resolve. They just give up. Yeah, I kind of wanted them to go down to one. All right. But, I mean, either way you do it. Either way it comes out. And not bad. I mean, 4-1, pretty, uh, just a hair's breadth away from a, uh, from a 5-0. But one of these days, I think I could 5-0 with this deck. I think this deck really does have a lot of good things going for it. All right. All right. Post-league wrap-up. And, you know, talk about a hair's breadth away from, uh, from the 5-0. It was only like mono white death and taxes, which even then came surprisingly close. It makes me wonder if I had remembered to force a negation of that aether vial, and if I had remembered to um, forget what it was exactly. Uh, I remember like if I remember to if I'd made a few less mistakes. It seems like I made some unfortunate critical mistakes. It makes me wonder if I could have five zeroed, you know. Um, and yeah, and actually I've still been playing this deck even after this league. That I recorded. I don't think I've actually changed anything. I think this 75 has been pretty good to me. Um, I don't think I've ever got less than a 3-2. Uh, I, I think I might even be mostly getting 4-1s, but like I don't even know if I got a 3-2. I might basically be getting all 4-1s, but I don't know. It's uh, it's been a while. I'll have to take I'll have to take a look if uh, if um, I'm pretty sure it's it's all other 4-1s. But anyway, um, maybe one day we will get the trophy with this and. I mean, I think we've got, we didn't see Rhinos, I don't think, but we definitely have Rhinos under control, I think, with the main deck Chalice, Ratchet Bomb in the sideboard, Force of, Force of Negation, Counterspell, Videlian Click to take away key, you know, key cards. I mean, it's just a surprisingly disruptive powerhouse. Hammer Time is, I think, pretty much in the bag. Um, I think we grinded surprisingly well against that Rakdos mid-range deck. I mean, I don't know what to say other than just that I think, I think this is, this is like, this really brings to, to the table a lot of similar elements or, or a lot of elements that have kind of some spiritual similarity, even if they don't look very similar on surface level, to like even the mono blue, the mono black, and like the mono white decks. I mean, this is just like it, this deck really kind of is another manifestation of these mid range type decks I love cranking out. Uh, and so far, I don't know if you count four cranking out. One of these days, I might try to make an actual mono green mid range deck. I mean, I just wasn't really feeling Infect, unfortunately. I, I might go back to it, but Infect's just, ugh. It's just, it's just, I don't, it's not my style. I really do think I tend to gravitate more towards mid-range these days. And I don't really, don't, I really don't feel like playing Tron. I just don't think I'm a Tron player at heart. It's the same nonsense where, like, you just get, you just kind of jam cards and you get shut off by nonsense. You are nonsense, you get shut off by nonsense. I'd rather be the deck that tries to fight against the nonsense than be the nonsense, if that makes sense, but I don't know. Either way, I think... I don't know, man. I think this deck has definite potential. It's got what blue might makes blue good. It's got counter magic. It's got. It's even got some stuff that blue's not supposed to have, like dismember, discard in the form of quasi discard in the form of Vendillion click, uh, sort of counter magic type effects that aren't technically counter magic. So Tavern of Souls doesn't stop it in the form of subtlety. Uh, a lock piece in the form of chalice. Um, it can mess with uh, lands in the form of uh, spreading seas and tide shaper out of the sideboard. I don't know, like, it's got, there's there's a lot of tricky sort of, there's a lot of maneuvering this deck can do, and it's uh, and it's mid-range, I mean, you, you play stuff, you attack, and, you know, and I'm still calling it Merfolk, it's a mono blue Merfolk with a lowercase m, but it's still Merfolk, because it still plays Svelun, which, you gotta admit, every time we drew Svelun, it was kind of the nuts, wasn't it? But anyway, hope you all enjoyed it. I know it's been, like, frickin' forever since I posted a blue deck, but, um, you know, and for some of you who have been following me, I think you can kind of see where this was going, because my, my Merfolk decks were getting more and more grindy, where I think I was basically cutting down to only like 16 actual main deck Merfolk. I think even at one point, maybe 12 actual Merfolk, I even cut Lord of Atlantis. 
<clears throat> I even started cutting Aether Vial, and, and, you know, and I also had this Mono Blue Control deck going on at the same time. So, like, I think you could kind of see where this was going, where basically this is kind of like just smoosh those two decks together. I just, the, the, the Merfolk deck kept cutting more and more Merfolk. It cut Aether Vial, it cut Lord of Atlantis, it was cutting more and more Merfolk, adding more and more counter magic and other things. The Control deck, I think, was adding more creatures, like Vendillion Click, Brazen Borrower, etc. Like... So the control deck started off mostly just counter magic and trying to win with like the man lands, which is okay. It actually did better than I thought it would, but it, it, it's honestly, it just was kind of annoying and it lent itself to this aggravating kind of gameplay where even if I was winning, ironically, it just, I don't know. It just, uh, and, it, and especially when I lost to another control deck, it's just like, oh, you know? Um, so I don't know. I mean, there could have been more merit to it. I do think that some, there was some leagues where, I never did that bad, but I think I'm definitely getting better results with this. But either way, no matter how you slice it, the at the end of the day, I was making the assessment that that control deck, that old mono blue control deck, needed to be a bit more preact proactive. So I was adding more creatures to that. I was taking more creatures out of the merfolk deck. Bada bing, bada boom. Next thing you know, basically, I meet somewhere in the middle, and you know, I don't know. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed. Um, hey, I finally did it. I finally put a mon more mono blue content out there. Hope you all liked it. And if you did, drop a like, drop a comment, and you know, consider joining me on Patreon. I really wish I could post more stuff. I think it, over this Memorial weekend, I posted a lot of stuff. Hopefully, that makes up for being, you know, less active than I would have otherwise liked. But um, but I got a lot of stuff. Thankfully, I got like what three, four videos or something up. You know, hey, that's not it's not half bad. You know, it honestly takes me like, you know, almost two hours per one of these things to actually dub the commentary, to add the titling, process the video, all that stuff. Um, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, like, obviously it's a little faster to do the, to do the dubbing than to just actually play and record at the same time. But like at the end of the day, it's still about, I would say an average of two hours per video. So that's, uh, but you know, you guys, you all like it. And, um, I mean, as long as you all like it, I'll continue to do my very best to try to, uh, put this stuff out there. You know, um, if it wasn't for you all encouraging me to get into, posting stuff on YouTube, I probably would mostly just be jamming games and not recording or anything, but just hoping to share with you all. Um, it uh, There is, you know, maybe something to be said here. I don't know. But at the end of the day, I love Monocolor, and I'm hoping maybe we can have a Monocolor Renaissance one of these days, right? I mean, am I right? Am I right? Anyway. All right. Hope you all do enjoy, and take care.